Hi guys and welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. I was actually going to post a mural video for my living room, but then realized I actually never started that project. Um, and in the meantime, I actually stumbled across an article about the shortage of lethal injection drugs in Ohio which uh, has delayed three executions as of right now. I was immediately intrigued and found out that the pharmaceutical companies have told the state that it would stop selling drugs to Ohio if they believe or suspect that their products are being used for um, executions. So I guess in a way that's kind of good news. But after a little deep dive, I found the Death Penalty um, Information Center, which is an amazing website, which I will link down below, and I realized that there are quite a lot of exonerations in the state of Ohio. Um, this obviously made me think of Elwood Jones, which is a case I am actively covering at the moment. Um, and a lot of the exonerations in Ohio were due to errors in prosecution. And that's actually terrifying to think of. And also one of the biggest reasons why I don't really believe in the death penalty at all. Um, the fact that you can give a death sentence um, only to have it overturned later on because of errors in prosecution is wild and it actually made me wonder how many people have been executed before they could be proven innocent or before their sentences could be commuted so yeah um heavy stuff i feel like i just kind of like dove right into the topic here but um this might be a long video so i do want to kind of get right into it. Um, I figured I could also procrastinate uh, on filing my f-bars by deep diving into this and also making a little video about some of the cases, um, try to figure out what the hell's going on in Ohio basically <laughs> because I just kind of sensed a pattern and I just, I, you know what, came up with enough content to make a video and here we are. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Elwood Jones uh, or his case, I have a few videos on my channel. I will link them down below. He was convicted of aggravated murder, robbery, and burglary in the 1994 murder of Rhoda Nathan. Rhoda, who was 67 at the time, had traveled to Cincinnati over the Labor Day weekend to attend a bar mitzvah for her best friend's grandson, um, and she was killed after she surprised a would-be robber in her room. Elwood Jones was an employee at the time. He was an employee of the Embassy Suites Hotel, um, which is where Rhoda Nathan had been staying. And although there was no direct evidence tying him to the crime scene, there's like no DNA, no fingerprints, no body fluids, no eyewitnesses, um, he was sentenced to death. And there's all there's an entire podcast um, podcast series on his case called The Accused. We'll link that down below. Everything I mentioned will be linked down below. Um, and it covers like the case and it highlights the evidence that was given during trial and the evidence that was withheld and the evidence that was later kind of debunked um, regarding the case. So that's quite interesting. If you want, if you're not familiar with the case and you want to look into that, um, please do. Um, and as of mid January of this year, he has been released on bond while waiting for a new trial. Um, the point of this specific video is to discuss some of the exonerated cases in Ohio, um, more specifically dealt with by Hamilton County. Not all the cases I mention involve the death penalty. Um, not all of the people I mention in these cases are innocent. And I just want to be clear that I'm not here to like defend any crimes or determine who's guilty, who's innocent. I do also understand that although I am discussing like the defendants and the sentences and mainly focusing on that, um, I haven't forgotten that there are also victims in these cases that deserve justice um, and their families deserve justice and closure as well. So with that being said, let's just dive right in. One of the most notable cases is the one involving William Virgil, who was found guilty of stabbing 54-year-old Retha Welch to death in 1987. The full case can be found on the Accused podcast as well. There's an entire series about um, this case, and it is a fascinating case. Um, so if you want more information, again, feel free to check that out. I will just be giving a condensed version. Um, on April 13th, 1987, Retha Welsh was found dead in her bathtub. She had been sexually assaulted, stabbed over 25 times, and repeatedly hit over the head with a vase. 
William Virgil was 35 at the time and had been in an on-again, off-again relationship with Retha, and 10 days after her murder, he was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. Police actually had six other potential suspects. None of them were investigated, and based on circumstantial evidence, he got sentenced to 70 years in prison, and his appeals were all denied. Um, in 2015, he actually finally won a motion to have DNA evidence tested, and since there was no match to his DNA, his conviction finally got overturned, and he filed a federal civil rights lawsuit. One of the officers admitted in his deposition that he paid the jailhouse informant cash. Virgil and his team were never made aware of this, and they also later found out that officers had withheld exculpatory evidence relating to alternate suspects and pretrial payments to a witness, which is very serious stuff. Um, he was awarded $28 million, $1 million per year he spent in prison, but he passed away in January 2022 at the age of 69. Um, he had only gotten about six years of freedom, six years of innocence after his initial, um, his first trial, and all of that for a crime he never committed. And the lawsuit was still pending when he passed away, actually, so he never got a fair trial, he never got any sense of justice, and the money ended up being distributed to his family, so he never actually got the money. He, they was only awarded um, after he had passed away, unfortunately. On June 12th, 1989, Diamond Martin and Jerome Thomas were found dead in a Hyundai sedan. Both had been shot twice in the head at close range. Uh, it was believed that the murders actually occurred at a different location and the car was later moved to, uh, or like abandoned in another neighborhood. Um, the investigators did find a pager number on a napkin and they phoned it hoping to get a potential witness and Sean Hawkins, whose pager number was on the napkin, informed police that he was supposed to sell them marijuana uh, the day before, but that deal never happened because he could never get um, in touch, or he could never get drugs from the suppliers, so he actually had no drugs to sell, so the deal fell through. Um, he claimed that he never even got inside the vehicle, but experts found two of his fingerprints inside the sedan, and a witness came forward to identify Sean as the killer. In September 1989, he was indicted for the aggravated murders of Thomas and Martine, and for each of the two murders, two counts were returned, and each of the four counts of aggravated murder carried two death penalty specific Sean Hawkins was also indicted on two separate accounts of aggravated robbery with a firearm specification in connection with each count. The only evidence that he was the trigger man was the testimony of 17-year-old Henry Brown, who testified under immunity after being charged with complicity to commit both aggravated robbery and aggravated murder. So. Henry Brown testified that there was another witness there as well, Rob Burns, who was in the car with Hawkins, um, and that Burns threatened Brown with a gun when he realized that Henry Brown had witnessed the murders. Um, however, for some reason, Burns was never charged in this case. Um, we can be relatively certain from the fingerprint evidence that, that Hawkins was in the vehicle when the victims were murdered, or at least shortly after, maybe he just moved the car. Uh, however, given that the only testimony naming him as the actual killer came from Henry Brown, we can really never be sure what role Hawkins played. Additionally to two fingerprints that belonged to Hawkins that were found in the car, there were, uh, there were three additional fingerprints that were never identified and Sean Hawkins was charged with the murders. Henry Brown was actually a suspect. Um, he was given full immunity from prosecution because he testified against Sean Hawkins. Uh, Sean Hawkins testified at trial and denied that, that he had any involvement in the murders. Several witnesses provided alibi evidence uh, in support of his innocence. However, the jury convicted Sean Hawkins of both murders and the trial moved into the sentencing phase. Um, unfortunately for Sean, his lawyer had not prepared a mitigation case for the sentencing. On June 8, 2011, six days before his execution date, the Ohio governor commuted Sean Hawkins' death sentence to life without parole because he had doubts regarding his role in this double murder. The board said it was bothered by several aspects of the case, including the possible involvement of other individuals who hadn't been fully investigated. And the board also cited conflicting statements by the sole eyewitness and also pointed out that even police didn't believe the crime occurred as 
Henry Brown described it. The board also was troubled by the fact that Hawkins' original attorney never presented evidence to the jury to argue against the death penalty or the death sentence, and instead he chastised and alienated the jury, which is the last thing you want as an attorney. Um, and one of the reasons for clemency given by the Ohio Parole Board was the many conflicting statements of Henry Brown. Henry Brown had actually changed his statement at least five times and he had failed two lie detector tests, although I don't believe any of those are admissible in court, but still doesn't look good. And also, obviously, you can't really rely on a witness testimony from someone who was there when the murder occurred, who's testifying in exchange for immunity. Obviously, if you get a shot at immunity, chances are you're just going to throw the other person under the bus. So that's just not really great. Um, knowing all of this, it is baffling that Sean was given the death penalty in the first place and was only six days away from being executed when his sentence was commuted. On October 12th, 1984, Derek Jamieson was arrested for robbing a Cincinnati restaurant. He apparently seemed to fit the description of one of the two men who had robbed the central bar and beaten the bartender, Gary Mitchell, to death. He wasn't charged at the time, but in January 1985, Charles Howell confessed to being an accomplice in the robbery and murder, and he identified Derek Jamieson as the primary killer. He testified against Jamieson in exchange for a lesser sentence, and Jamieson was found guilty and sentenced to death. This one really annoys me. They had like three pieces of evidence, one of them being that he fit the description of one of the robbers. Fair enough. Char Charles Howell testified against him. That's the second piece of evidence, so someone else said that he did it. The third one was that there was a shoe print at the crime scene that was similar to the shoes Jamieson had been wearing when he was arrested the first time. Like, not even a match, just like similar. Like, we don't even know what shoes he was wearing the day of the robbery, right? When the murder happened, like two months before he was questioned or arrested the first time. But the shoes he happened to be wearing that time, they're like, eh, it kind of looks like the one from the robbery. Like, similar, not a match. That was one of the pieces of evidence, and he was given the death sentence. After having two appeals denied, a new attorney uncovered exculpatory evidence that had been withheld from the defense. It's sounding like deja vu, right? In police interviews, several witnesses decried seeing two men running from the scene of the crime. One was approximately five foot six, holding a brass pipe that presumably was used to beat Mitchell, and the other was approximately six feet tall. However, Howell is about six feet tall, but Jamieson is six foot four. It's very tall. So this testimony contradicted Howell's story that he had committed the crime with Jamieson. So as much as Jamieson was said to resemble one of the robbers, he also didn't match the height just given by the eyewitness. But that testimony was never brought to trial. Jamieson was eventually given a new trial, and on February 28th, 2005, the Ohio Court of Common Pleas dismissed the charges against Jamieson. He was removed from death row and was released from prison on October 25th, 2005. During his 20 years in prison, Jamieson survived six death warrants and once came within 90 minutes of execution. Genesis Hill was convicted in 1991 of aggravated murder for killing his six-month-old daughter, Domika. Hamilton County prosecutors argued that the infant was violently shaken. However, the First District Court of Appeals of Ohio ruled that Hill was entitled to an appeal and, in, and later on, federal judge Edmund Sargis overturned Hill's death sentence based on evidence that Hill fell off a wall while holding his daughter and accidentally crushed the infant's skull with his knee, which is just such a, I mean, it's a tragic case all around. Um, Genesis Hill had admitted breaking into his girlfriend's house um, to take the girl, but he fell off a retaining wall while holding his daughter and his knee crushed her head. In addition, um, a police report withheld from Hill's attorneys at trial became available and that report questioned the credibility of the main witness who was Genesis' um, girlfriend at the time, Domika's mother, and the report also included allegations that the baby bore physical signs of poor care provided by her mother. 
Um, Hamilton County Judge Lisa Allen gave Hill a 30-year sentence and eligibility for parole, commuting his previous death sentence. So, still in prison, um, still serving time for this, but at least he's no longer on death row. Similarly, on June 24th, 2019, the Ohio Supreme Court agreed to cancel a scheduled October execution for death row inmate Angelo Fears. After prosecutors and defense attorneys agreed his sentence should be changed to life without parole, Fears was initially sentenced to die for the 1997 shooting of Antoine Gilliam during a drug robbery, and after many failed appeals, a new lawyer argued that the testing of the gun used in the shooting showed that it was prone to firing accidentally and had actually been subject to a manufacturer's recall for firing pin malfunction. The defense attorney, Robert Lindman, argued that the shooting was unintentional and therefore not a death penalty case. Lindman also argued that Angela Fears suffered from intellectual disabilities that should have made him ineligible for the death penalty regardless. Now, for the case of George Franklin, um, not to be confused with the case of George Franklin in California, which is a massive case. It has its own, like, show. Um, I, w- I want to say it's called Buried. I can't remember. It's very famous, and I kept getting articles for this one instead of the one I was looking for. Um, so this is a very different George Franklin. But in December 1988, George Franklin was charged with one count of aggravated murder with death penalty specifications for the homicide of Gerald Strauss as well as two counts of burglary. The trial court sentenced Franklin to death. He appealed multiple times, but his claims were always dismissed. He eventually was granted appeals based on three issues, um, ineffective assistance of trial counsel, discriminatory use of peremptory challenges by the prosecutor. I had to look up peremptory. It means um, not open to appeal or challenge and the prosecutor's failure to provide the defense with material exculpatory and impeachment evidence at trial. Patricia Arthur was one of the jurors in this case, like during during trial, um, and she expressed the opinion that Mr. Franklin should prove his innocence, demonstrating that Ms. Arthur had prematurely determined that Mr. Franklin was guilty you know, innocent until proven guilty, she was saying, well, he needs to prove he's innocent. That means you're already assuming he's guilty. Uh, So her service as a juror in this case violated Mr. Franklin's rights. And given that a biased juror was impaneled in his case, the ineffectiveness of Franklin's trial and appellate counsel was presumed and a new trial was required. Now, because this case was quite difficult to research online, um, like I, I was sifting through like court case notes and like text and like legal jargon hurts my brain. I couldn't find like a straightforward explanation as to which appeal was successful. However, I did find out that on April 17th, 2007, George Franklin was taken off of death row and was given a new sentence, which was 50 years to life. On July 15th, 1987, Ronald Dean Combs shot and killed Peggy Schoonover and her mother, Joan Schoonover. Peggy and Combs had been involved in a relationship and had a child together, a son named Joseph, and the shootings took place in the Holiday Park Tower parking lot in downtown Cincinnati, and an off-duty police officer, Deputy Sheriff James Neal, witnessed the shootings. Nobody in this case actually is debating whether or not he's innocent. Um, Ronald Dean Combs is... um, definitely happy to confirm that he did shoot both of these women. He wasn't trying to um, claim innocence. He His defense was that he was too intoxicated from alcohol and drugs to form the requisite intent to kill the women or to have committed the killings with prior calculation and design. Regardless of his intoxication at the time, the jury did believe that he... Um, had intent before killing these women. Uh, Ronald Dean Combs was convicted by an Ohio jury of two counts of aggravated murder as well as specification of an aggravated circumstance as to each count and he was sentenced to death. Combs appealed and set forth 29 claims. I think he appealed multiple times. Um, It wasn't successful the first time around. He set forth 29 claims, including various claims of ineffective assistance of counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, trial court error, and challenges to the constitutionality of his death sentence. One of the main issues was that Combs' lawyer's testimony 
directly contradicted the sole defense theory that Combs lacked the requisite intent to commit murder. So although the defense counsel presented substantial testimonial evidence that Combs was like really intoxicated at the time of the shootings, his testimony was essentially rendered worthless because the defense's own expert testified that Combs' intoxication did not legally excuse his crime. So like, essentially not defending him. So that was one of the main claims um, during the appeal. Uh, he was removed from death row on the 16th of February 2001 and instead of a death penalty, he received a 63 year sentence after pleading guilty to the murders um, before even going to second trial. I think they just... Uh, came up with an arrangement. Um, however, he died in prison in 2004. Daryl Gump and Michael Beese were given death sentences for the kidnapping, attempted rape, and the murder of 10-year-old Aaron Rains in 1992. However, their sentences were commuted when they were found to be mentally disabled. It was also determined by a federal judge that they didn't receive a fair trial. When it came to overturning their sentences, they still pleaded guilty to the charges. They were given 35 years instead of the death penalty, so they each had to serve 35 years. They had already spent 23 years by that point, um, and they could have also have been executed at any point in those 23 years. From what I gathered on the Death Penalty Information Center, which again is an amazing website, in 2002, the Supreme Court established that it would be cruel and unusual punishment to sentence people with intellectual disabilities to death. If you do read the case notes online, they're pretty easy to find for Daryl Gump and Michael Bice. It is a very difficult read. Um, I can absolutely see why people wanted a very strong sentence. However, the issue is that there were several categories of evidence the state failed to turn over prior to trial, such as evidence against other suspects, including suspects confessing to having committed the crime. So like this one guy was considered a suspect and he even went on to confess to the murder and that was not looked into or maybe it was it just wasn't brought to trial for some unknown reason evidence there was also evidence regarding the prosecutor's implied timeline of the crime and there was also impeachment evidence um, so that refers to the process of discrediting or undermining the credibility of a witness during a trial either by presenting evidence or asking questions that contradict their testimony or reveal a bias or inconsistency or falsehood in their statements. Um, because of this and also the revelation that both defendants were found to be mentally disabled by, I believe, a psychiatrist, like an actual expert, um, their sentences were commuted. Uh, again, they still had to serve 35 years and they are still in prison as of right now, but they were no longer on death row. Um, I have mentioned the Brady Clause in my last video, if you've watched that one, and to quote Brady, society wins not only when the guilty are convicted, but when criminal trials are fair. It's very easy to no longer care about a fair trial if it means the outcome of the trial it matches what you think is fair, and if you think the person is guilty, then you're kind of like, well, get him no matter what, you know, like, or get them no matter what. Um, who cares about a fair trial? They're guilty and they don't deserve a fair trial, right? Uh, I feel like a lot of people believe that if someone is guilty, you know, who cares about a fair trial as long as it leads to a prosecution, but the right to a fair trial is an absolute right um, and protecting the right to a fair trial ensures that the criminal legal systems and the societies we live in are fair, equal, and just. More recently, on January 27th of this year, Marcus Sapp was released on bond after spending 13 years in prison for crimes he did not commit. He had been charged with three counts of murder, as well as felonious assault, aggravated robbery, and aggravated burglary involving two incidents. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison for the two separate incidents, the murders of Robert Lane and Todd Oliver in November 2007, and the murder of Andrew Cunningham and the assault of Tyler Irvin in January 2008. Two separate incidents, two murders in November 2007, and one murder and assault in January 2008. 
Little did Marcus and his team and the prosecution and everybody else knew, the surviving victim had identified another suspect a few days after the crime, and if police had provided this vital piece of evidence prior to the trial, Marcus wouldn't have had to spend 13 years in prison for crimes he didn't commit, and there would have been actual justice for the victims and their families. There wasn't any physical evidence in this case, no fingerprints or DNA, just like a single eyewitness and two testimonies from guys in prison who were hoping for leniency in exchange for evidence in this case, right? Like no conflict of interest whatsoever. But police knew that Marcus Sapp wasn't the person identified by Tyler. They had further evidence against the man who was initially pointed out as, or like identified as the suspect. They had actual evidence against this person. And like, I don't understand, like I couldn't figure out why they didn't pursue that guy, right? Who most likely committed the murders. I don't know, I wasn't there. And instead they just showed up in court and they're like, Mark Sapp, that's him. Not really, but we'll say it's him. Close enough. Don't worry though, um, I'm pretty sure the officers responsible won't be facing any consequences. I guess withholding evidence is only really like a problem if you're not a police officer. Um, allegedly, right? Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> Last but not least, Walter Raglan, who was convicted in 1996 of aggravated murder in Michael Bainey's death requested a new trial to have his sentence commuted. He filed a motion based on the findings of a study that determined the odds of receiving a death sentence were 5.33 times higher than other aggravated murder cases simply because of his race and the race of the victim. The study was conducted by the Columbia Human Rights Law Review, which analyzed 599 aggravated murder charges in Hamilton County from January 1992 to August 2017. The reason this study zeroed in on Hamilton County specifically was because it has one of the highest capital punishment rates in the country, like not even the state. I mean, I'm pretty sure the state as well, but like the country. Hamilton County prosecutor Joe Dieters has said he considers cases for death penalty eligibility only if there is no issue of proof. <laughs> like, Joe's not gonna watch this video, but like, could you please elaborate? Because I feel like there has been hella issue with proof in a lot of these. So, I mean, he's no longer the Hamilton County uh, prosecutor. I'm pretty sure he works for like the Supreme Court now, which is <laughs> great news for Ohio or maybe the States. I don't know. I'm not, I don't live there. So anyway. Why I'm bringing this up and mentioning Hamilton County is because that's the same county Elwood Jones is involved with and well, I'm, I say involved with, that's the county under which he was sentenced and whatnot. Um, and I'm really not surprised given the amount of evidence withheld. So like what, 4,000 pages, including hundreds of pages of witness statements, right? Withheld from court during his first trial, and also the amount of like witness statements ignored on top of the death penalty given, despite the reasonable doubt of Elwood Jones's involvement in the murder of Rhoda Nathan. Um, so yeah, that and the fact that there's absolutely no you know physical evidence tying. There's just a lot going on with that case, but it just like all of these cases really just struck a chord. I feel like uh, as I was reading all of these cases and the outcomes and the trials and what happened, it was just uh, sounding too familiar, to be honest. Uh, Hamilton County currently has 21 people on death row, uh, the most out of any county in Ohio. And there's uh, a still ongoing um, death penalty information center review of prosecutorial misconduct in death penalty cases nationwide and it has identified at least four Hamilton County death sentences that were overturned or death row prisoners exonerated as a result of prosecutors withholding exculpatory evidence, which is very serious. Like, and also terrifying, like, absolutely fucking terrifying. Capital punishment may be imposed only when the guilt of the person charged is based upon clear and convincing evidence, leaving no room for an alternative explanation of the facts. 
as we all know, the system is clearly capable of error, and it's my personal opinion that unless a trial is flawless, then nobody should have their life on the line. Um, I know a lot of people disagree. Um, in the US, more than 190 people have been released from death row with evidence of their innocence. That doesn't include the people who were taken off death row and had their sentences commuted. You know, even if they're guilty, it's just like the sen the original sentence was like way too harsh for either for the crime committed or the evidence presented in court. Um, and again, in my personal opinion, I feel like all it should have taken is one case where someone was on death row and later found to be innocent. And then I feel like everyone should have just said like, yeah, we can't risk this. Um, apparently not, but again, this is not just an issue with the, the United States. A 2009 poll commissioned by the uh, DPIC found police chiefs ranked the death penalty last among ways to reduce violent crime, and police chiefs also considered the death penalty the least efficient use of taxpayers' money. In totality, Ohio spends close to $17 million per year on the death penalty. Like, that's, I can think of so many other things to do with that money. But yeah, I think a lot of people believe in, you know, an eye for an eye or that it's only fair, like maybe they'll, you'll get more closure. And I'm sure maybe some people do, but I think it has been uh, somewhat researched that a lot of people don't really get the closure they think they will by having someone executed for a crime they committed against, like a family member or a loved one. Um, ultimately, I'm sure they would just want that person back. Um, and also, I think a lot of people think it's the, the quick, like this, it's just, you're saving money. It's just like, right, we'll just execute them and then save money on prison. But it actually is very expensive, it turns out, to deal with the death penalty. Of course, this video, um, the point of this video is not um, to discuss the morality of the death penalty, or I'm not trying to change your mind. Um, and I'm not here to defend uh, criminals who are on death row. Uh, whether or not, you know, they're guilty or innocent. I'm not here to uh, defend them. I just noticed that so many cases from Hamilton County had similar issues, which is withholding of evidence, unfair trials, ineffective assistance of counsel, a very clear racial bias when it comes to sentencing, um, it, you know, prosecution or police officers withholding exculpatory evidence so on and so forth. And despite the trial errors and the witness statements ignored and the exculpatory evidence withheld, the defendants I mentioned were given very long sentences or even the death penalty, because I understand not all the people I mentioned were given the death penalty. But while not all of them are actually innocent, they all ended up with commuted sentences or exonerated sentences. And I know that these issues can happen anywhere. Again, this is not just the United States, um, but there's there's definitely clear documentation that Hamilton County is definitely the wrong place to be if you're accused of any crimes. Like, did you know like Hamilton County is like the Lord Farquaad of, uh, of like Ohio or the States maybe? Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. I don't know, allegedly, allegedly do not come for me. Don't Please don't sue me. I can't afford an unfair trial. <laughs> um, for real though, I'm just joking. Um, you know, my issue as well is, you know, when are the people involved going to face consequences for their actions that lead to these mistrials or these, these massive errors in prosecution or like, this is not a justice system. Like, when are the, like, the detectives or the police officers or any other, you know, whether it's a lawyer, whoever, like, official with like legal responsibilities right anyone who's like dismissed testimonies withheld evidence you know so on and so forth when are they going to face the consequences of their actions who's going to set um who's going to start the snowball effect of like you know this needs to stop and we need to start punishing people for this uh, and i don't care if it's you know negligence ignorance or malice whatever it is it doesn't matter um, these people who are in a position of power keep getting away with it. And until they're held to the same standards uh, as the people they view as guilty or criminal, these unfair trials are going to keep happening. The death penalty will be given even when there's not enough evidence or even if you're innocent. And that should concern seriously everybody 
regardless of, you know, your need for revenge based on a case. Um, and I think it's important to also be faster with like the, the retrials or whenever there is like an appeal or whatever else that could lead to someone's, uh, you know, that could lead to someone's exoneration or at least to uh, a different sentencing. Um, I think it's important for prosecutors to get it right first time, but um, it's not like I have any solution aside from like maybe stop withhold withholding evidence. <laughs> That's or maybe just like I don't know, give everyone a fair trial. That's just probably too much to ask. And there's a lot of factors that not everyone can con control, right? Which kind of furthers my point that if if you can't have a perfect trial, then how can you? put someone's life on the line um but yeah I don't even know how to wrap this video up but I just wanted to talk about this it also took me like a really long time to put all this information together because there was a lot and there's a lot of people I haven't mentioned in this video like there are way more and also like I'm just talking about Hamilton County in Ohio because again I'm the only case I'm pretty much still covering on my channel is like Elwood Jones and that's why I feel, obviously I'm not trying to say this isn't happening anywhere else or in any other states um it's just that there's just a lot going on in ohio specifically cincinnati specifically one county so yeah let me know what your thoughts are on this video um i know this was probably a really long one but had to be done and there was a lot to talk about so that's that i hope you're all doing well and i will catch you in the next one